All right, I'm um, honored to present our next speaker, uh, Jacob Pleschno from the University of Chicago um, Booth School of Business. He uh, was previously um, actually a professor at um, the Graduate School of Business at Columbia University and um, also uh, spent some time, as I understand it, at Microsoft Research, um, IBM, and Yahoo. So um, he um, is very interested in allocation mechanisms and um, design of marketplaces and oh, now all of a sudden I'm very loud. Um, design of marketplaces and um, yeah, market design in general. I guess that's the same thing. All right, Th um, so um, please join me in welcoming uh, Jacob and yeah, take it away. Thank you very much, happy to be here. Um, so, like, I have a maybe a bit of provocative title here. Like, this monopoly without monopolist does not, by any means, try to claim that Bitcoin will be a monopolist. Yeah? But one of the points of the paper, and I hope that I'll get this across, is that uh, there will be much less adverse effects if Bitcoin were to be a monopolist. Like, usually, we don't like monopolists because they create all sorts of distortions. And Bitcoin creates, or oh, blockchain technology, the decentralization, creates some like way of avoiding uh, those harmful effects, even if something, if, even if the platform, even if Bitcoin indeed does become a monopoly. Um, um, so what will, what I'm gonna try to do in this paper is like, thank you for the introduction. Um, like I think of market design, of how market structure, uh, how market structure is first like um, driven by the, uh, like the rules that we have. What kind of implication do we have for like the rules for payment on the system? And second, what does those rules for payment mean, in, in, in mean for the functionality of the system? Yeah. So we're gonna try to think through this and then through that I may be able to convince you that there's something in this design that is useful in that it mitigates adverse effects of monopoly. Um, and I should say that this work is joint work with Go Huberman and Siamak Molami. Go Huberman is then the finance group in Columbia Business School. Siamak is in the operations group. And this project basically started because Go was teaching a uh, MBA class on fintech, and he came to my office and said, like, I should explain, I should figure out what Bitcoin is, and explain to him because I know what computer science is. And I told him that I'm not a computer scientist, so he should leave me alone, but he was persistent enough, and we figured out together and realized that there's something that we should like, actually uh, spend some research time on. Yeah? So, thanks, Jeff. Yeah? Um, okay, so I, I don't think the slide is necessary here, but let me still start with it. This is very intentionally outdated. Yeah? So uh, I guess a lot of you went on this website called CoinMarketCap, it shows the long list of different cryptocurrencies that all have um, pretty high market, uh, market caps. And there's a couple of numbers that you can notice here, like you can think of the price of how much is a Bitcoin. Well, this is a pretty meaningless number because like, the units are not, like, are not meaningful. Like if we split the Bitcoins into units of 10 versus one, you know, nothing should really happen. The market cap, is maybe a bit more meaningful. It's like how much the total holdings of Bitcoin are. But this is not something that I claim to understand much about. This is something that has to do with monetary policy. It's like what's the worth of gold? What's the worth of something else? And like that's not really something new about Bitcoin either. Like we had a lot of a lot of assets that are kind of like fiat money. Uh, but you want to like point at the column here, which is volume, uh, is should be some, some column that's really interesting because um, like that's the point that we want to focus on, which is think what you, what you wish about whether Bitcoin is a valuable asset or invaluable asset or sensible or not. It is actually transferring a lot of money over the internet. So uh, this volume is not exactly the number that goes on chain, but like a lot of money gets transferred via the Bitcoin network, via the Bitcoin system. And it's been doing this so pretty reliably. It's, um, 
Bitcoin hasn't been hacked. Like there's been a bunch of hacks of people that had the Bitcoin wallets hacked. It's like paper money got stolen. But there wasn't any hacks of Bitcoin that are equivalent to forgeries of paper money. So at least in some sense, Bitcoin has been able to provide some functionality of transferring money online. And in that, it's a proof of concept of something that is actually functioning and successful. We have a system for digitally moving money uh, over, like, over the internet. Um, and I want to say this is, I think this is interesting, but before like, I want to say that this is interesting, I think that this requires some justification because it's not a new thing to move money over the internet. Like, there's a lot of ways that we had for a long time to move money over the internet. So <coughs> the traditional way in which you send money digitally <coughs> would usually involve some company, PayPal, Venmo, uh, Swift, Fedwire, or just your Bank of America app that would have some, um, that would have some uh, company set up a server and give some access to users. And the users would say to the company, please move my money. And the company would just like have a database that says how much money each person has and just update this database. And if you don't want to do this electronically, you're willing to do this on like physical records, this goes back for like thousands of years, right? Like, like all these accounting systems are not really new. There's not any, uh, there's nothing really difficult about doing this. So you just need to keep records. But the thing that, that um, the thing that um, is required here is that somebody has to be a trusted record keeper. So when I do this with Bank of America, with the random amount of PayPal, I need to trust that Venmo and PayPal are indeed keeping the books in order in the way that's like that, uh, that transfer system should work. They're not taking money out of my account without my authorization, and they're not printing money out of thin air and giving money to somebody. Uh, and I need to trust uh, Venmo for doing that. And you can say that one of the benefits of a system like Bitcoin or Ethereum or all those cryptocurrencies is that you don't need to trust anybody. And while this is um, certainly appealing to some people, like the lack of trust in the system, um, for most of us, it's not really an issue. Like, I don't think anybody in this room um, thought twice before putting money in his Bank of America account, thinking that maybe Bank of America will steal my money. Right? We have like, social structures that deal with that. And we have organizations that we can trust to do those record keepers. Um, um, but um, what I do want to argue is that is, there is some cost to this model, this traditional payment system model of doing this record keeping, because once you need to trust some entity to do this, this entity will get some power. Uh, and in particular, they get pricing power. So Venmo and PayPal um, are imperfect substitutes for each other. Like if you have, if all your friends are on PayPal, you want to use PayPal as well, which allows PayPal to charge you for using PayPal and not just switching to Venmo whenever it's cheaper. And generally in this payment system, uh, in this payment system um, uh, industry, it's pretty like, it, it's hard to enter because you need to be trustworthy in order to enter here. And even if you manage to be trustworthy, there's some not sort of network externalities that makes it hard for you to attract consumers, which give you pricing power. And like Visa and MasterCard, like I'll kind of like think of them as one of the examples. Um, it's hard to negotiate with them. There's all sort of government regulation on them because we know that they would like to charge high prices and they have the power to do so. You know? So like two things that as an economist you wouldn't like about this traditional model is this trust like in a certain in a certain entity that controls the entire network, gives them the power to, um, to price, and therefore you expect to have some monopoly dead with loss, where this company would want to set the price too high and exclude some customers. And second, um, you may worry about a holder problem, where this company uh, may not be able to commit. You can think that uh, most startups actually um, try to offer their services for free initially, 
And you know that sometime down the line, they will actually start charging you, or they will be advertising or something like that. Um, and sometimes that's detrimental because you would like to commit and tell people that you should switch all your payment system to my platform, and don't worry, three years down the line, I'm not going to charge you more. So um, this blockchain technology provides kind of an alternative that answers both of those issues. Yeah? It also answers the trust, but like I want to focus on the other two things where I can put some economic cost on them. So how is it different? Yeah, so I want to, like, I, I know that you all know how this works, but let me just say this in a market structure perspective. Yeah? So first, it's kind of like Uber. Yeah? So think of the traditional payment system as the bus company. They have their own buses, they have their own servers, you communicate with them. Um, Bitcoin says, well, instead of needing a bus that's owned by the company to serve this, any, any, anybody can drive you. So instead of having the servers that sit in Venmo's headquarters, now I can have each one of your our computers can be part of the infrastructure for the Bitcoin network. And the crucial part of it is that they don't need to trust those, com those computers. They don't need to be trusted entities that operate the system. And so anybody can be a provider. Um, so that's kind of like Uber, yeah, that anybody can provide their service. Yeah. Uh, but there's another step, because Uber actually sets pricing on its platform. Here, the platform is not controlled by any ent entity either. The platform is controlled by the protocol. The protocol is a computer code that settles the set of rules that determines everything that's going to go on the protocol. How much are you getting get paid for being a miner? Well, that's going to be determined by what the protocol says. Nobody can change this, or at least it's hard to change. It requires some agreement on a change in the protocol to change it. Yeah? And for simplicity during this talk, I'm just going to assume that this is fixed. So what this means is that we're going to have something like a two-sided market where we have users that want the same kind of service that they would ask for my company. You, I have on my phone my uh, Bank of America app and I have my Bitcoin app. Both of them allow me to send money and provide me with similar usage. But the server that will process my transaction in Bank of America is inside Bank of America's headquarter. The server that will process my transaction for Bitcoin is can be any one of you, anybody who wants to own. And this will, of course, induce a very different market structure. So what I want to ask is, <coughs> um, how does the market structure that is created by Bitcoin compares to the market structure that we have by the firm? What kind of properties that we have? For a firm, we kind of know what will happen. We know that the firm sets the rules as it wishes. It can change them as it goes along. Um, the infrastructure level, how many servers do I want, the firm will just procure as many servers as it needs and can adjust it over time. The pricing, a firm can price however it wants and adjust it and it will generally price not to maximize social welfare but to maximize its own revenue, which often creates inefficiencies. How does those things happen, uh, happen by, with Bitcoin? So we know that the rules are going to be fixed by the protocol. And all those other levels of infrastructure at the pricing will be determined in equilibrium given the protocol rules. And what we're going to do, what I'm going to spend most of my time is uh, just uh, focus on those parts and, and talk about how the infrastructure is determined by an entry and exit dynamic together with the determination of revenue in the system. And how pricing in the system is going to be determined by congestion pricing. It's going to rise somewhat. Uh, endogenously, uh, given the protocol rules that are set. Yeah. Yeah. And say that the, those protocol rules will have some very good properties. I think that it will have some, thing, some nice things that are hard to achieve uh, when you have a traditional model of a firm-run company. But like, there's some problems. For example, uh, a firm will balance supply and demand. If there's more transaction demand, the firm will just get more servers. We'll see that in Bitcoin, like, there's not really this functionality in the marketplace. And there's not even the functionality that other marketplaces, like a market for oil, actually makes oil production go up when there's more demand for oil. There's not going to be such a thing in the market for Bitcoin. So inherently, this market design has some flaws in it. And we think of it as kind of a very 
interesting proof of concept, but uh, if I'll have time at the end, I'll talk about some ideas of how we can improve this consistent jump track. Okay, so I spent way too long on this introduction, but let me sort of dive in and start like actually talking about what we do in the paper. Yeah? Um, so first, I'm not gonna like review Bitcoin. I'm assuming that like it's not necessary here, but let me just talk about a couple of properties that are important for the market structure. Yeah? And um, some of those may be uh, like a bit incidental actually, because like to design a decentralized protocol, there's all sort of limitations. And some of those properties arise maybe not necessarily because Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever it was, like intentionally wanted this, but there's just design constraints where he designed those protocols. Yeah? So the first is in Bitcoin, the choice was that users can decide whatever transaction fees they want to pay. So if I want to send money to Sergey, then I post the transaction, I, send, I say in this transaction how much am I going to pay Sergey, how much money Sergey will get, but also how much money is going to be paid to whoever processes this transaction. That's totally my decision. Um, and that's observable like, when I send this message. And second, that the miners, the computers that operate the network, uh, they get to choose which pending transactions to process. And that's something that's a bit of a uh, constraint on the system because the system does not really know what, what the miners saw or didn't see. So the miners like, will have some choice. Like the, the protocol cannot really dictate to the miners uh, how to produce transactions because it doesn't know which transactions the miner saw. So the miner can see all the pending transactions and he can see how much each one of them is paying and he can decide how to prioritize them, which ones to put in the block. And I'm going to say that the transaction is processed once it's included in the block. Uh, new blocks are added at a process process. So a block in Bitcoin is added every 10 minutes, um, but every 10 minutes on average. Um, because of the way that random miners are selected, like they're, they're all trying to do hash functions, each one of them has a low probability of success. Many attempts together trying to get a success gives you a very good, to a very good approximation of Poisson process. Yeah? So that means the block time is going to be random and there's going to be inherent randomness in the system. That's going to be important. I'll get back to this. Um, and one really... Uh, Re property that really makes this different from a lot of other markets is that if I double the number of miners, the capacity of the system stays the same. So if I have twice as many miners, the system will still keep the blocks coming at one block per 10 minutes on average by just doubling the difficulty. So adding more resources to the system, more infrastructure, does not actually increase its capacity, does not actually increase its uh, uh, what it can provide to users. Um, and that's uh, partly because more miners means more coordination problem. And more, more people we need to think up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and the last part is miners are free to enter and exit. Yeah. Uh, in practice, there's fixed cost. If you want to buy a mine, like, uh, um, an ASIC, that's some fixed cost, but I'm going to ignore this for the purpose of the talk with the caveats that will be obvious, I hope. Yeah. So I'm going to translate this into, um, into the following economic model. Yeah. So this is going to be very stylized, uh, but it's intentionally stylized to help us think about the two-sided market structure here. Yeah. So I'm going to call the number of mining units N. Think of this as equivalent of ASICs, of ASIC successors. And I'm going to assume that there's many small miners with the margin cost CM. So there may be some really big miners, there's maybe somebody who is a uh, mining farm in Iceland with really good technology that has lower cost. Yeah? I, I don't care about that, I care about the marginal miner, the guy who's just thinking about whether I should become a miner or not. Yeah? And I want to say that there's a lot of those guys that can start mining at some cost CM. Yeah? And think of those as you guys, we, that can potentially enter mining or not, and we have some ant miner that we can buy on the market and start running this with some margin cost of extra. Yeah. Um, and for us, there's going to be free entry and exit because we can sell our machines or we can just buy them or rent them. Yeah. Blocks are going to be added at rate mu. 
Think of this as one block per 10 minutes on average. Each block process k transactions. To make things simple, I'm gonna think about Bitcoin before SegWit, so I'm gonna think of k as 2,000 transactions. Um, and that means that the system capacity is k times mu. Regardless of how many miners they have, the average rate in blo which blocks arrive is, is mu. Uh, each block allows me to process k transactions, so the capacity of the system, the number of transactions per unit time the system can process, is k times mu. This, so this is a description of full description of, uh, of everything that they need on the service side, on the provider side. On the user side, I'm gonna assume that I have users that come in. Uh, each user receives some utility, which is R minus C times W minus B. So R is how much value I have from using this payment system. And that may be heterogeneous between users because some user may wanna buy something on the dark web and I don't really have any alternative. Either I buy with Bitcoin or I don't buy at all. So this value of being able to process transactions is really high. And some users want to buy coffee at a coffee shop and they can alternatively pay with a credit card. So the value from like having the Bitcoin network process the transaction is pretty low. Except for this reward, users will have two kinds of cost. One is C times W which is some cost per waiting time times the delay, because transactions in Bitcoins are not gonna be processed immediately, and you're gonna have some cost per how much delay uh, you're gonna incur until your Bitcoin transaction is gonna be processed. Think of some guy standing in the coffee shop and just like trying to wait until a block process transaction so he can leave with his coffee, versus a guy that buys furniture or some illicit materials online and doesn't really care whether it processed like in a day or in an hour, because he's gonna get delivered in a month. Yeah? And the last part is B, is B is gonna be how much transaction fees the user decides to post. And as we said, that's a, decision, that's a choice of the user. When I send a transaction, I decide how much, spend, how much transaction fee to pay. Yeah? And for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna think of willingness to pay as being either high or low. Yeah? And I'm gonna make it independent of your waiting cost because uh, that's uh, a stylized example that helps me show you the starkest contrast between the Vim run payment system and what happens in blockchain. Yeah? It's not supposed to be like the description of reality, it's just supposed to be the cleanest setting to, to see the distinction. Yeah? And transaction arrive at some Poisson rate lambda, which is below the capacity of the system, below this k times mu. So on average, the system has excess capacity, but because the arrival of blocks is random and the arrival of agents is random, it is possible to have periodic delays. So a block comes on average every 10 minutes, but it so happened that the block only arrived after 15 minutes. Because it took 15 minutes, there can be some backlog that build up. Yeah? So some users will wait. Yeah. Yeah. As a benchmark, let me start by just saying what will happen if I take the same users that I have and have a traditional firm process the transaction, like let them procure their services for a firm. And this is a plain vanilla standard result that the firm will want to price discriminate. And I set up the model to make the firm want to price discriminate. Like if the value of servicing only the high value customers and not the low value customer gives more revenue to the firm, then the firm would just like to exclude the low value customers, which is good for the firm, but harms welfare. And also, if the consumer gets locked in and the value goes up, the firm would want to raise prices. So that's, you can also see the holder problem. Yeah. yeah, so that's gonna be the benchmark. Now let me switch to talking about Bitcoin and see how the market structure in Bitcoin will determine pricing and what will happen under this different uh, market structure. So um, I'm going to start by thinking about the miner side, uh, the service provider, because um, both because it's going to be simpler and because once I establish this, the other side will be easier. So <coughs> the first result is that this Bitcoin uh, market structure, or the open uh, decentralized nature of Bitcoin, Remove the pricing power of the miners, even if they're allowed. So, if you're like, and the 
the way to see this is if you're a small miner in Bitcoin, you have no pricing power. If I'm a small miner, what can I do? Well, I'm going to get selected to be the one that issues the next block pretty rarely. When I do, I can decide which transactions go in or not. So I can announce to users that, well, you should pay a lot in your transaction fees, otherwise I can exclude you, which is a legitimate threat. I can exclude transactions that are low, and therefore like, punish people for having no transaction, trying to push them up. But that will be a very weak threat because I get chosen very rarely. So it's like unlikely that I'll be able to act on this. And second, even if I do get selected, the transaction can get just as processed in the next block. So if I'm small, I should have no, no market power. There's no reason that anybody should listen to what I say people should charge. Because when I actually get to my block, I would just want to take all the transactions regardless of how much they pay. Yeah? Uh, until I finish my block. And if the block is full, I would just like to pay, take all the highest paying transactions, and like I basically can't tell the users how much they should, they should pay in transactions. Uh, the more interesting part is what happens if you're large? Uh, so suppose I'm 30% of the, of the mining pool. So 30% of the blocks will be mine. Now, if I threaten you that if you don't pay $10 of transactions, you're not going to get included, that would mean that if you don't pay $10 a transaction, 30% of the time, you're going to be delayed to the next block. Now, this is now a credible threat. Now, this actually uh, allows a miner that's sizable enough to actually um, affect transaction. Now, so if I refuse to pr process all the low-paying transactions, some people will say, I don't want to get delayed, therefore I should pay higher. But the result that we have is that this is not going to be um, in the benefit of this large miner because of entry. Because while you have this entry channel, <coughs> this miner can induce the users to pay more transaction fees, but those transaction fees will just induce other miners to enter. And when the other miners will enter, it, you'll just dissipate all the rents that you would have gotten by inducing users to pay more. And therefore, like, you can't actually benefit from increasing the transaction fee. Yeah? So this creates a pretty strong discipline on all miners. As long as um, you have this free entry, then you get that all the miners will act as if they're price takers. Yeah? So I should say there's two caveats here. One is that if you're a large miner with enough of a, uh, enough of a cost advantage, you can just make it unaffordable for you for uh, those marginal miners to enter. And a second, there are some uh, attacks, like uh, censoring attacks, that can prevent other miners from entering. Uh, but assuming that the entry channel is open, this is a very strong control over like, the pricing power of all miners. Okay? Yeah. So we're going to assume that this uh, holds. And therefore, all miners are going to be price takers. And that actually really simplifies uh, really simplifies the behavior of all miners, because now it doesn't matter which miner you are, you're small, you're big, the best thing you can do is just this canonical uh, strategy of just processing all the transactions that pay the most until you, uh, until you either exhaust all the transactions or exhaust all the space in the block. Since all miners do exactly the same thing, all miners expect to have the same profit per share of computational power, and that gives us a very simple entry condition. The total, <coughs> um, the total number of miners must be such that the marginal miner is indifferent between entering and exiting. So if I denote the revenue that's, get, that's given by <coughs> transaction fees by rev, and the revenue for minted coin as S times E, so S being like the 12 and a half Bitcoin, E being the exchange rate, um, and I in include the exchange rate here because um, the miners' costs are going to be denominated in dollars. Everything in this model is going to be denominated in dollars, except for the block rewards that have to be specified in the protocol in units of the coin. The 12 and a half Bitcoin in the protocol have to be specified in units of Bitcoin and therefore are subject to, uh, to, to, uh, to exchange rate fluctuation. Sorry. 
that's the only place where the exchange rate will show in. Um, the expected payment per miner is going to be just like the total revenue from coin and transaction fees divided by the number of miners. And since the marginal miner must break even, we get that the number of miners is as given above. Um, um, so I'll get back to this number, but like just to you know that this number, this S times E, fluctuates with exchange rate. Uh, so if you, this means that if you base your um, uh, payment to the mining pool based on the old coin, then when the coin appreciates, you're going to pay them all. When the coin depreciates, you're going to pay them less. This is exactly what we see in Bitcoin. Yeah? And that causes the mining pool, uh, the size of the mining pool, to fluctuate with exchange rate. Yeah? And like, I'm going to foreshadow and just say that the number of miners on the system is unlikely to be in any, in any sense optimal because it's just going to be randomly determined by exchange rate fluctuation. And I'm going to show you that the revenue from transaction fees is also going to be fluctuating. Yeah? So overall, those two things are fluctuating. So there's no sense in which the number of miners in the system is in any sense optimal. Yeah? OK, let me skip this and jump to the users. Yeah? So now we understand the miner side. And now what we know that all the miners are going to just process the top k transactions that, uh, that are available. The game for the users become much simpler. So user once uh, user has a heterogeneous delay cost C, they want to maximize the reward. Um, the reward R minus how much they pay in delay minus how much they pay in transaction fees, and also they need to decide whether they want to participate or not. If this entire thing is negative, they don't want to participate. So assuming that they want to participate, they need to trade off how much I pay versus how much delay I get. And the delay function will be the result of a congestion queuing game where I know that all the miners will just process their highest fee paying transactions. So bidding a higher fee will basically just getting higher priority for pro ganking process. And this just gets us back to uh, congestion queuing games where users can bid for priority. And we can get a functional form for what is this w. How much will I wait, given that I bid b, and the distribution of others bid is g. And that's this functional form here. It depends only on this raw hat on, um, do I have this slide here? Ah, sorry, I don't have what I. Um, so we get that this waiting time depends on this. Uh, so ignore the messy math, but just the, the waiting time depends only on the block size k, uh, this new minus 1, this arrival rate every 10 minutes, which is just a normalization, uh, moving between how many blocks you have to wait to how much time it will take for those blocks to arrive. And uh, this raw hat, well, this raw hat is how much congestion is in the system where we only take into account the users that have higher priority than you. Um, so let me just illustrate how this thing looks by saying, suppose that I pay zero. Yeah? Suppose I say, I'm going to be the last person in the system. The effective congestion for me from people with high priority is everybody. How long will I wait? Well, that should depend on the congestion of the system, how many people there are. If the system is not very congested, if the ratio of the arrival of transactions to the capacity of the system is below 50%, basically nobody waits. Those blocks are unlikely to get filled up. There's unlikely to be build up of uh, backlogs. Once I approach 100% utilization, Delay explodes. This is a very uh, common uh, classical result in stochastic systems and queuing systems. And you need excess capacity, otherwise you get delays that explode. Um, so um, what it means is that I don't really care about my priority if the system is not congested. I care a lot about my priority if the system is congested. Um, so we're going to get different payments whether the system is congested or not. Um, yeah. um, let me just jump 
like we have functional forms in the paper, but let me just jump and tell you what are the properties of the equilibrium that result from this congestion queuing game. Yeah. So first, if willingness to pay is high enough, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So once willingness to pay is high enough, everybody would like to, to participate. So the, the system does not ex exclude anybody as opposed to the firm. And the more impatient you are, like intuitively, you should be willing to pay more, and indeed you do pay more, you get high priority, less delay. How much do you pay is exactly the externality that you impose on other users. Huh? So everybody's gonna participate in the system. If I'm gonna pay a higher transaction fees, I'm gonna cut the line in front of other users. How much I pay is exactly the expected delay I incur on the users I cut in ahead of. Huh? And that means that the expected delay uh, I impose on them is going to be dependent on how conge much congestion is the system. If the system is not congested and I can't in front of other people, I didn't delay it by them by much. But if the system is congested and I cut in front of them, I may have delayed them by a lot. Okay. Like I took this rare spot that they may be getting. So the transaction fees are going to be independent of the user's willingness to pay, but will vary with the congestion. So let me give you this graph of how the dependence look. And it's a lot like the previous graph. Like if the congestion is low, users don't really care about how much, how much, how much priority they get because they're gonna get processed quickly in any case. If congestion approaches one, there's gonna be a lot of delays in the system and the marginal uh, change in increasing priority can make a really big difference in how much delay you get. So therefore, I pay a lot. Yeah. Um, and the payments explode as congestion approaches one. Um, and you can see that there's some sort of sweet spot here, or somewhat like sweet spot of like 85% congestion, where if you go really low, the system doesn't get any revenue from transaction fees. Like, so of course, you, you need some funding for the system, so that's not good. You don't want the transaction fees to explode. But you can find this kind of like middle ground, like you can think of 85% where the system can raise some revenue without too much, like uh, uh, with having some intermediate level of congestion. Yeah? And let me just put on top of the slide also dots that give you some empirical data. Yeah? So what we did, we took um, the data from uh, the Bitcoin blockchain up to the SegWit point. Well, trans like, uh, system could process at a capacity of about 2,000 transactions per 10 minutes. And uh, blocks were one, one megabyte. And we took the size of the block as uh, the average size of the block over a day as a measure for the congestion during the day. If the average size of the block during the day was half a megabyte, we say that the system was using 50% of its capacity. If the average size of the block during the day was 90, 0.9 megabytes, we say the system is using 90% of its capacity. So that uh, determines the horizontal uh, coordinate for each one of those blue dots. Each blue dot is going to be A. The vertical axis is how much transaction fees per block were paid uh, during that day. Huh? When we convert the Bitcoin denominated fee to the equivalent US dollars of that day. And you can see that like the, it's not perfect, of course, but like the empirical data kind of seems to match to some extent uh, uh, a line where there's no congestion on the blockchain. Transaction fees are essentially zero. Well, congestion approaches one, you get like crazy high transaction fees. And if I were to, like, I don't have a zoom in, I don't know how well I can see, like given that the y-axis blows up, not to see, but like around 0.8, you actually see significantly positive transactions, yeah? as predicted by this theory. And the system still has excess capacity on average in this point, when you have 80% capacity utilization. Um, but still, like, there's gonna be some transaction fees paid because of the stochastics in the system, because of those stochastics. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, sort of tallying up. So what does it mean for the transaction fees? Is this the good system or not? So the system can raise the revenue without excluding anybody. Um, I'm basically paying, charging users for speed instead of for service. 
So if you don't want to pay any money for a transaction, you'll just, just have to wait for uh, your transaction to get processed. Um, it's going to give strictly positive net reward to all users. Yeah, because, because you pay your externality, you don't pay something that depends on your willingness to pay. Yeah? All users can have strictly net positive uh, reward, which is impossible under a firm. Yeah? If all users really like using Bitcoin, Bitcoin does not raise its prices. If all users really like using a firm, the firm would like to raise its prices. Yeah? Um, so payments do not pay on willingness to pay, so I don't get monopoly pricing, I don't get hold up. And this is true even if like, that's the only system that users can see. And so even if uh, everybody is forced to use Bitcoin, we're not going to get somebody extracting all the rents from all of us having no other option, as opposed to Visa, right? Giving Visa the unique ability to process all transactions in the economy will be a terrible idea, because Visa will immediately jack up the price. Right? So Bitcoin is in some sense immune, but um, the fees vary over time yeah, because uh, demand varies over time. Like, just look at this graph and like very, sometimes the fees are huge, sometimes the fees are zero. Um, and the fees are also vary over time and not in a way that is, is good for the system. It, like, they vary over the time because of the congestion, not because of the need for those transaction fees. The times where people were paying high transaction fee may be also the times where people said, hey, like, there's too much mining. We should pay less to miners. Yeah? But there's nothing that aligns how much you think miners should be paid with how much transaction fees are given to them. Yeah? Um, also, if you think that the system could actually choose the, uh, the level of congestion, there's going to be some trade-off here. Because yeah? low congestion means that there's no revenue, but, and you need sufficiently high congestion to get the revenue. But when you raise the, the congestion, you also raise the delay cost. So now, because now people need to wait. You know? And this is necessary, because if nobody waits, nobody pays. And so, so to induce some people to pay those transaction fees, you must have those who don't pay wait. So you're going to have some two curves. One is how much revenue you get. Another is this delay cost. How much delay you, you impose on users in order to raise this revenue. And this delay cost is necessary. It's a result of an incentive company. Um, so if I want to compare welfare under Bitcoin to welfare under firm, like there's at least three things that I should account as a cost for using Bitcoin. One is that just using this distributed system is um, less efficient. Uh, anything that you can do with a distributed system, you could do more easily with a centralized system. And uh, just take all the miners in Bitcoin, move them to an Amazon server, Amazon farm, manage them directly. You could do exactly the same thing. You can have exactly the same properties from a kind of like a protocol perspective, data uh, ledger management perspective. So there's there's no new kind of functionality that Beacon gives you. No? And it's a much costlier design to give you this functionality. It's much cheaper to uh, have one trusted entity to this ledger than to have all this coordination. Yeah? So first, there's this costly design. Second, those delay costs that I just mentioned. And third, there's all those uh, inoptimalities in the design, like the amount of mining is unlikely to be optimal. If you want to add security concerns or anything else, you can tag it along, and then like, you'll have a more complex comparison, because you know, like, trying to argue which is more secure is not what I, uh, not, not, uh, I want to focus on. Um, yeah, so we have those three costs. But on the other hand, we had a cost of the firm, which is the deadweight loss, because the firm will exclude the low willingness to pay customers. So, um, those costs are in, depend on mutually exclusive parameters. So how much more costly it is to run the blockchain is, in a sense, completely independent of how much welfare loss they have in the firm from excluding the low willingness to pay customer. So I can make up parameters where it is actually social welfare improving to uh, move to a blockchain design because the dead loss of the firm will cause too much harm. 
or vice versa, if the film doesn't cause too much deadweight loss, then it's not going to be uh, well for improving to move to a blockchain design that has all those extra costs. Uh, kind of the comparison is uh, building two power plants next to each other. If you build two power plants next to each other and they compete, you get competitive electricity, but you had to build two power plants. If you build one power plant, you only build one, but then the firm that owns this power plant can jack up the price. Which one is going to be better? Well, that depends on how costly it is to build the second power plant. Right? So, how good is your regulation? Same thing here. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so far I was talking about like, the design of Bitcoin as it is. Yeah. But there's, um, there's, there's a lot of other uh, cryptocurrencies out there, and like one of the cryptocurrencies you definitely heard of, Ethereum, um, is in intentionally thinking of itself as like an iterated version where they continuously try to improve on their design and update it. And I think that's the right approach here. Like all those things are kind of in better mode. And um, we're, we're facing the Netscapes of the world. That's not like the hopefully not the last iteration. Uh, so what can we add to the design of those things? Well, so right now, um, we have a fixed capacity system, and therefore the transaction fees fluctuate. Yeah? So when you have low demand, like there's no transaction fees. Where you have high demand, you have congestion and a lot of transaction fees. So what we want to kind of just suggest is like just Target stable congestion. Instead of having a difficulty adjustment mechanism in Bitcoin that, uh, <coughs> that ensures that the block arrives on average every 10 minutes, have a very similar adjustment mechanism that ensures that blocks are 80% full. And if you ensure that blocks are always 80% full, you keep the congestion fixed, you can actually uh, generate a fixed steady uh, stream of transaction fees that is paid to miners in US dollars. So just using block rewards will not give you a steady stream of payment to miners in US dollars because the exchange rate fluctuates. But if you use a steady congestion, then because people pay for delay, they pay for delay in US dollar equivalents, and you keep the delay parameters kind of constant, you will be able to generate a stream of US dollars uh, fixed in dollars. Now, what is the right level of this? That's a question. What we can say is tell you also some things uh, using this analysis of how the stochastic system behaves. We can say tell you something analysis of how to achieve this capacity uh, trading off like the block rate and block size. You can do this with big blocks. Or you can do this with frequent blocks. So trying to understand what's the effect of a block we first show that the, as the block size becomes large, and large here can be 20, like once this uh, block size is 20, those approximations are become really, uh, really good already. Um, then the revenue that you get from the block size is just k times the revenue per slot in the block. And so the way to think about it is big blocks are just like in highway with many toll lines. Well, it's just a scale version of just like some idealized infinite, uh, infinite block size system where like there's just one toll line for many. Uh, for many. Yeah. So this is some scaling that allows us to kind of uh, tweak the block size parameter a bit more uh, tractably. And once we do this, we get that the, uh, that the trade offs you can get between how much revenue you raise and how much delay cost you have. Both of them will be a function of congestion, and both of them will lie on this curve in our infinite approximation. And for a finite, for a finite, um, for a finite size block, you just get a scaled version of the same curve to got approximate. So what does this curve look like? On the horizontal axis, I put how much revenue you get. On the vertical axis, how much delay cost you're imposing on users. And you should think of it as a scale of a starting from zero, zero. If I have infinite capacity, no congestion, then I impose no delay cost on users. Nobody has to wait. But also, nobody pays. As I increase the congestion, then people start paying more and waiting more. 
And you can see that both of them will go to infinity. But what you can see here is that as I start increasing the congestion, I get a very vertical line. So it means that as I increase the congestion a bit, I get people to pay more, to suffer more delay cost, but I hardly get any more payment from them. Yeah? So if I want to have any, any, even a slightly uh, positive level of revenue, I need to get a significant amount of delay cost to motivate agents to actually, uh, to actually pay me this slightly uh, positive. So this is a curve with uh, a uniform uh, delay cost, uh, but we can prove that this holds more generally. If you look at low delay cost, um, the revenue grows subpolynomially, and the, de the delay cost grows linearly. So that means that you're going to be inefficient in this small regime. Which basically means that as you take this curve that I showed you before and scale it up, you're going to get a worse curve. So this cur those curves tell you what is going to be the trade-off, the set of trade-offs you can have between revenue and delay cost for different block sizes. And one way to look at it is suppose I want to get a revenue of $2,000 per unit time. If I want to achieve this with a block size of 20, I need to impose much less delay cost on the users to achieve this than a block size of 200, less than a block size of 2,000, less than a block size of 20,000, where the y-axis here is logarithmic. So demand will be where you are on the line. Demand will determine what's the ratio between the capacity of the system and uh, uh, the congestion is going to be the ratio of the demand to the capacity of the system. Demand will be where you're on the line. Um, so, yeah, and adjusting to the capacity of the system um, by block frequency to respond to demand with a fixed block size means that they can transverse this line, and they want to transverse this line with a minimal block size that they can. Huh? Huh? So maybe this is a bit into the weeds, but like lower block sizes will actually make this pricing mechanism work more efficiently and you'll be able to get more revenue from users at a lower uh, delay cost. Okay. Um, so that's it. I think I'm out of time, right? Um, so let me just wrap up. So I think that um, there's, there's a lot of criticism you can say about blockchain, that it's a buzzword, that I think a lot of the ideas, a lot of what people say uh, about blockchain treats blockchain like a stone soup. Yeah? Like there's this old fable where you take a pot of water, you can make a stone soup, you just need to put a stone in it, and then add all the other ingredients of the soup. Yeah? So I feel like often blockchain is just like, oh, once we have blockchain, all the other problems will go away. Why? Um, but like, it does have some economic innovation, yeah? because it has some new governance structure, new market structure. So we're able to provide a market structure where we have a functioning payment system, where we don't need to trust anybody, and therefore we have some free entry uh, we don't have an owner, we don't have a pricing power for any entity. And the free entry provides a very, uh, <coughs> a very strong control on the pricing power of the miners. So even if miners are big, they will not have any pricing power in this system. Uh, as long as the entry margin is open. And I think that's this congestion pricing uh, that I, that happens under the Bitcoin protocol is an interesting pricing mechanism. It allows you to raise revenue without excluding anybody. Um, it requires some delay cost. It's inefficient to raising low amounts, so it's maybe not the, the perfect mechanism, and certainly can be approved on in some respects, but it's, it has some, I think, interesting properties and like, can be useful. And I think it's also, like to wrap up, that this design, uh, fails to balance supply and demand. Like, even the suggestion to wait and end can give you a steady state of income for the market, but it doesn't tell you what it is. Uh, how much mining should we have? The, the markets usually try to inform you about quality of products that you have or drive some inputs. Like, there's some market functions that are lacking in this design, and I think it will be really interesting for future research to try to address. Um, and that's it. Uh, so, thank you very much.
So of course it's not uh, it's not going to capture everything, and part of it is is like construction, right? We don't want to capture everything uh, in this design. We'd want to highlight some like whole parts of this market. And I, I, I'm not sure I followed your example, but part of what's happening in this entry margin is that if you try to flood the market with transactions, it's going to be more costly for you when other miners can come into the market. So I, 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 can, I can talk to you offline. If, if, some, if somebody is the sole provider of mining hardware, that changes some of the considerations here. And you can think of this as changing the free entry condition. Yeah? And that's, as I said, like, free entry plays a very significant role here. If you say that like, for some reason this doesn't hold, like, a lot of things like, change. Um, but you should also think of like this uh, um, bit main, like the ASIC producer, like has sort of a monopoly on the ASICs, but for a limited amount of time, not indefinitely. Other players come in. So like, I, I agree that like this ignores from this uh, ignores this margin of what happens with the with bit main. But on the other hand, you don't want to jump to the other perspective either, where bit main is the only player forever. And at least, like that, also allows you to think of what happens when you have uh, easier entry to mining or other entry to mining. What's some of the cost has? Yes. Yeah, I, I took like a welfare perspective when saying not the miners. Um, the miners here actually um, they cover the cost in any case. Uh, so unless you uh, have like if you have something like Bitmain or some group of miners that can deter entry, then the the miners will make up the cost like CM in any case because if users will pay more, just more miners will enter. Uh, so in a sense, like there's this protection. Uh, miners' desires. Um, miners, I think, in practice, don't fully appreciate it and still want users to pay more transaction fees. Or, like, as, or, uh, like legitimately worried about it once you have a fixed cost model. Now, like, this becomes a more complicated calculation for the miners, and they do care about increases versus decreases. Um, and I think that one of the nice things about this is kind of like... Um, arises uh, in the Bitcoin protocol, in the blockchain like Nakamoto protocol, without any kind of involvement. There's all sort of tweaks that you can think about and kind of mechanism design tweaks that you can do to the transaction fee or how users will pay that will help mitigate those things. Um, and I, I think one of the um, kind of like at, at the high level, it's one of the challenges is how do we uh, come up uh, in some way that avoids the tragedy of the common. Altogether, want to pay for the system, but we need some incentive mechanism to make it um, incentive compatible for each one of us to pay the transaction fees and not game the system, both for miner side and users. And the space of mechanism here is kind of tricky to crack, right? At least I didn't see any good way to fully, fully think about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, people. Okay. Thank you.